it sponsors once a year uh, a lecture series by a distinguished mathematician. Uh, uh, the lecture series is of, uh, consists of three lectures. Uh, this year they will be held uh, today and Tuesday and Thursday at 4 o'clock. Uh, will be largely independent as I understand and uh, accessible to a wide audience. Um, Professor Eliasberg uh, was born in Leningrad, uh, where he studied and got his PhD in 1972 uh, from Wolfgang. And uh, he worked in Russia until uh, he moved in 1988 to the USA. And since then he's been uh, in Stanford University. Uh, his research uh, spans uh, areas uh, related to symplectic topology, uh, in particular questions of uh, flexibility versus rigidity in uh, symplectic uh, topology. I'm not an expert on the area. I spied on him on the net. And <laughs> uh, I hope we will learn more through this course, uh, through the course of this week, uh, what these words mean. Uh, he also works on um, theories of harmonic functions in relation to symplectic geometry and uh, in contact topology, uh, especially in dimensions three, uh, theory of confoliations. So uh, all these areas are various aspects of uh, symplectic topology and geometry. Uh, he uh, is a very well-known uh, lecturer uh, gave many invited lectures, uh, prestigious ones, among them twice uh, at the ICM. And uh, Professor Elish Belek is the recipient of the Leningrad Mathematical Society Prize, uh, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Veblen Prize in Geometry, uh, which he received last year. So uh, I'll remind you that the three lectures today, uh, this week, uh, all have uh, symplectic topology in the title, three examples from symplectic topology. Today we'll hear about symplectic topology and Morse theory. On Tuesday about symplectic topology and low dimensional topology. And on Thursday about symplectic topology and the theory of several complex variables. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, we plan to go uh, to a restaurant on um, Thursday night. Uh, after uh, eating after the last talk, and those who wish to uh, 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 attend the dinner, uh, please see me uh, today or tomorrow. But we'll have to make reservations. So thank you very much. And I forgot to say thank you for coming, and thanks for coming, especially in this difficult day. So. So this is the process, the first theorem of uh, syntax topology. 
Georgia, which was in fact proven not by Don Juan Carre, but by Pirko a few uh, years after uh, Juan Carre's death. And Juan Carre, in fact, wrote extremely dramatic paper about this uh, statement that he said, saying that he was, uh, he's kind of extremely unusual for him to, to publish paper without proof, but he already too old, he was 59. And uh, so, so he afraid that he, otherwise he kind of wouldn't be able to say what he already achieved along this proof of the theory. So uh, the theory of cancer, or the statement of Poincaré says that if you have a just flat annulus, and you have a just some area form, and then you have a, uh, say, transformation of this annulus, which preserves the area. So for instance, if you say smooth, you have a Jacobian identically equal to one. And then you, uh, it has a kind of the property that it treats boundary components of the direction. This, of course, needs to be made a little bit more precise because this is a circle, so not exactly clear what it means to be twisted in the opposite direction. But let me kind of leave it uh, aside. So this is a, you can think how to make it rigorous. And so you have such information, and then, uh, then so this area preserving, and then this condition of area preserving should imply that this F has at least two fixed points, two geometrically different fixed points. So um, you see. Poincaré, in fact, of course, was a very, very, in some sense, applied mathematician. So he was interested not in this uh, area preserving, preserving map. He was studying, uh, uh, say, he was interested, one of his main interests was a three body problem. And this kind of question arrived when he tried to, to study the structure of periodic orbit of uh, so called restricted three body problems. So uh, relate this question to, to this question from uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. So, what is the kind of the Poincaré uh, motivation? So he, he kind of never proved this theorem. It, uh, it was proved, as I mentioned, a few years later by Virgo, but it, the proof was correct, but in a sense, ideologically wrong. Because he gave this proof, it was used some very nice trick, but then uh, this kind of it didn't lead to any development because somehow that was a trick. It worked for this case, but not for nothing more. So, uh, what what was this? Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I promised to have this lecture for general audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have. So what was the kind of Poincaré motivation for this statement? So, well, I'll give you a few motivations. So one of this is the following. So let's say, kind of look, what is the infinitesimal version of this statement? So let's, so what is the, so if you consider this kind of group of area preserving transformation, then the um, real algebra of this group this is so-called uh, corresponding consists of Hamiltonian vector field, or kind of in this case, just divergent-free vector field. And so uh, it can, it, it generated by some function. So in this case, you, you would like to have some function h. And uh, you, you consider with each function. Uh, so we think about this annulus, say, lying in the plane. And how we identify our plane with, say, this, this complex so line. And then we consider the vector field P, which is equal to I times gradient of H. So, and I want to take it in this case function H, which is a constant function H, which is a constant on the boundary. So then you have some kind of picture of uh, level set of this function, and uh, this vector field I times gradient is is tangent to the level set. And the condition, condition that you, you want to have a, our one boundary term one way, not the other way, just saying that our function uh, f the gradient of h point in this direction uh, on this boundary, and uh, it's pointed kind of on this, this, this direction on this boundary. So, kind of, so the function 
function of h, if I can draw this is a graph of this function, it has to supposed to have some kind of graph like this. Right? So it, it, well, it grows or, or decay doesn't matter in near the boundary. So, and then what are, if you have a, such infinitesimal transformation, or just you take the flow of this of this vector field for some time, then the fixed point is precisely critical point of this function. And so the statement that such function must have uh, must have uh, some uh, critical points, at least two critical points, and of course it must have some maximum somewhere, and it has, must have somewhere settled points. This, this will be our two critical points. So you can slightly glo globalize this up. Namely, let me kind of, to do this, Ah, so is it, uh, I don't just move, okay. I just didn't want to, to, pro, to, pro, to break something. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's uh, look kind of in the following pictures. So this map is defined on the, uh, uh, on the sum domain in the plane, but suppose we have, let's, for a second, the whole plane. So let's let just do the following thing. So you, you have some uh, surface, yeah? And on this surface, you have area form. So in this case, this is just dx, dy. This, it, 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 this is the place. So you have an area form. And then you can take a, you can take a product of f with f. And then you get a four manifold, and you take a differential form omega plus minus omega. This is a called, it's a symplectic form, it's maximum and non degenerate two forms there. And then what we notice is that if you take a diagonal in this f cross f, then this form omega on this diagonal vanish, right? But also, if you take a, any area preserving map, if you take a map which, which has a property f star of omega equal omega, then and, you, and then you take a graph of this map f, just set of points f x f of x, then of course uh, this omega capital restricted to, to gamma f is, is equal again omega minus omega, so it's again zero. And so we have this property that both graph of our area preserving map and uh, diagonal has this property that our symplectic form vanishes on this on this map. So such ma such surfaces, such two dimensional surfaces in this case. So the surface L, the two dimensional surface in our so let's call it L in our four-dimensional manifold M uh, is called Lagrangian. It's called Lagrangian if omega restricted to this L is equal to zero. So Lagrangian surfaces, so graph of area preserving map and diagonal, which is a graph of identity map, of course it's area preserving, it's, it's uh, Lagrangian surface. Uh, and what is big omega? Big omega is just omega plus minus omega. So you take a you take a product and you take a four omega here and, and this is this minus sign here. So you have some dx dy and dx capital dy capital. So now let's kind of get a little bit familiar more with, with this Lagrangian surfaces. So there is a kind of what, what is this? So on one hand, we can think about this Lagrangian surface as a heat locally as this graph of this area preserving map in this picture, but kind of more, uh, let, 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 let's do a different picture. So let's take a, suppose we are in the space R4. And then this form, uh, omega capital, which we consider, can be written in the form, okay, it's say dx1, dy1, and I wrote it minus, but it's just up to the notation of the coordinates. 
I can write plus the two divided. So you have this R4 with this form. And so, and also, remember that this uh, R4, let's think about the C2, and then this omega is just nothing else as an imaginary part of the Keller matrix, standard Keller matrix. And so, just using this identification, it's easy to, to see immediately that L Lagrangian, L Lagrangian, if and only if, if you take a tangent space to TL and multiply it by, by I, then it becomes orthogonal to itself. So Lagrangian surfaces and surfaces, say, which kind of local with respect to the subjective form, which have this property that each tangent plane is absolutely real, maximum real as possible. So when you multiply by I, it becomes orthogonal to itself. So another good kind of form is the following, to understanding this. So you have this omega, so restrict, so suppose for a second, this surface L is a graphical in this coordinate. So you can write it in the form y2 is equal to some function, y1 is equal to phi1 of x1, x2, and y2 is equal phi2 of x1, y2. So suppose you can write this in this form, and then what we see is that L omega restricted to L is, is equal uh, dx1 uh, d phi1 plus dx2 d phi2. And so, so therefore this is just uh, up to time. It's it just d of this uh, phi1 dx1 plus uh, phi2 dx2. And so it says this form is closed, and because we are in Euclidean space, it's the same as saying that this is exact. So, this is, so that means that this is equal d of some function f. And so Lagrangian surfaces are graphs of gradient or differential or, or, or some function. Okay. So now let's return to this to this kind of picture uh, which, we, which we have. We have area preserving transformation, area preserving transformation of, of annulus, but let's say of R2. And now you take a cross, cross R2 cross R2, this is how R4 with this symplectic form omega. And then, as I said, with respect to the symplectic form omega, diagonal, diagonal is a is Lagrangian. And also we have a graph, graph of our kind of graph of our uh, area preserved transformation is also Lagrangian. Now, and the fixed points are precisely of course intersection of the diagonal with the graph. So so now in uh, this is a just stand this is a standard R4. And in the standard R4, this splitting, so what was special here when I took choose this projection? So both directions, x1, x2, and y1, y2 were Lagrangian. So this kind of splitting called polarization. And in fact, you can take a, any Lagrangian plane and consider splitting corresponding to this Lagrangian plane. Take a Lagrangian diagonal and an orthogonal complex. And so with respect to this splitting, what we see is that this if graph of this function would be like graphical with respect to the splitting, it need not to be, but if it if it's graphical, then again what we see that this is a graph of differential of function, and this intersection point is a just a critical point of this function. And so therefore this argument which I had infinitesimally would be applied kind of semi-globally here because it's already not infinitesimal transformation, it's big one, but the only condition that it's uh, still, the graph is still graphic. So, but now this is uh, not good enough. So that, of course, that's all Poincaré knew, and that was his motivation for, for his theory. But then you can start to kind of to see what happened after that. that you start to, to, to deform our map further, further from identity, and in fact, despite that 
calculated graphical in the splitting f cross f, it need not to be graphical in this splitting. And so therefore, it would kind of, the everything would be reduced to problem of kind of studying critical points of Lagrangian manifold like this, which in, in a sense looks like multi-valued function. So, that, so therefore, the uh, whole problem of the synthetic topology, in a sense, is just which, for this purpose, is just understanding what is the kind of geometry of multi, what is the more theory for multi-valued function. And that's what I'm going to explain. It turns out that there exists some way of get rid of this. Uh, so you see, what, what, okay, before I say what is possible, let me, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, this kind of picture. So now, let's, let's suppose we are still in the space, okay, let's R4, or doesn't matter, we can take a more general case, R2N, and in this R2N, you have a, uh, some general symplectic form, omega is equal, say, sum of the I, dy i, x, j, dy j, and then you have an arbitrary Lagrangian submit. So you have an omega, omega restricted to L is equal to J. So how can we visualize this? So notice that if you take any graphical part, then this graphical part would still correspond to uh, graph of differential of function. But then we just need to know what happens when you have this, all this kind of folding. So we can, so this is our x1, xn. Coordinate, this is a y1, yn. But now we can consider one more coordinate. So let's, this is still our x coordinate. And now let's introduce one more coordinate and draw the graph of this function. So I draw a graph of this function, and then somehow you have a, here I have to jump to this branch. And it turns out that kind of jump would look like some kind of cusp. Then I jump, so I get picture which would look something like this. So this thing is called front of our Lagrangian manifold, and if Lagrangian manifold is graphical, this will be just graph of function, otherwise it will be front. And now we need to understand kind of inter we are interested in the critical point of this front. But by doing this, we also must control that this thing correspond to some embedded Lagrangian manifold, which would correspond to the uh, property that if you take a difference between any branches of the front, that they do not have a critical point. So somehow we have to look at all this complicated picture and understand what is the kind of property of this multivariate function and all the differences of these branches it is. Well, so you can, in a sense, do this up to some extent, but this is a kind of very uh, complicated thing. So what you would like to do, you would like to trade this complexity of the front for dimension. It turns out that this extremely complicated picture in, in dimension, in fixed dimension, can be reduced to very simple graphical picture, but in dimension much bigger. And so therefore, instead of working this kind of critical function in critical point for given manifold, you will have to work in some bigger manifold, but then still with normal function. And that's kind of the first idea the idea of symplectic topology, the idea of generating function. So let's let me now before I before I kind of go and explain how it, it can be done, let me consider one more example. So this was a kind of motivation coming from uh, from Poincare theorem. Let me consider another motivation coming even from one-dimensional mostly. So we had a two-dimensional, but still let's go down to one dimension. Okay, so let's start with, um, with Rollet here. So suppose you have a, you have a function on, on, say, interval 0, 1, and, okay, suppose the value of this function is equal at this end. Well, so that, then we know that this function must have a maximum, or must have some critical point. Well, in fact, there is a kind of two case of, of royalty. 
you, if you just, suppose you prescribe derivative this way, on one end it's a positive, on another it's negative. And then, if you, if you draw the graph, so this is a graph of our function, and if you draw the graph of the derivative, then uh, here it has to be positive, here it has to be negative, so just by simple continuity, it has to cross zero section. So this is kind of trivial case. But then there is a less trivial case. Suppose we have a, our derivative, derivative here is also positive. So, so this kind of, if we would not need to know that this thing is a, uh, is a graph of derivative of this function, then of course we can connect it without any critical point. But nevertheless we cannot. Why? Because we have a, some kind of global restriction that the integral has to be equal to zero. Right? So equal to zero and this force this intersection. Well, so this is a, this is a kind of trivial of course statement, but let's try to now generalize this statement to, to some kind of already multi-valued function. Well, so if, so this is our Lagrangian manifold in this case, the graph of differential, graph of derivative of our function. So one dimensional Lagrangian manifold. Of course in dimension one, like any curve is Lagrangian manifold, there's not much to say. So, so therefore we can also start to consider arbitrary Lagrangian method. But say embedded Lagrangian method. And then with this arbitrary Lagrangian manifold, you already would start to have some kind of front front picture instead of instead of this uh, nice graph picture. So can you repeat how do you move from the uh, from the picture below to the front above? This is an integral. Yeah. So you, you just okay. So then let's do this exercise. So so this is a so, so suppose this is a this is supposed to be graph of the derivative of our function. And so so therefore z is just integral of of y dx. Right. So I just I go and I integrate. And then, so so this thing is supposed to represent the area. Okay, so, so this picture is not really kind of very realistic. So what I do? Anyway, I go up to here, and then my area grows. Right? So it's not linearly grows, but somehow grows. Then, uh, as I came here, I, I integrate in opposite <coughs> direction. Right? And so I I'm sub start, start to subtract subtract area, and I'm subtracting more than I added when I came here. So therefore, this picture would start to go below. You would have, and then I came to this one, and then here I would add more than I had below. So I would go like this one. So the picture, in fact, for this picture will be something like this. So you just, uh, just integrating this, this type of function. So this kind of, you can use it for calculus. So, uh, anyway, now, still, if I have a property that this curve is embedded, then I, I still, and, and if I know that this end has to be here, then the area under this graph has to be equal to zero, so I still need to have an intersection. Okay, now let's, let me kind of, uh, so this is a still trivial. So let me generalize to something not trivial. So let me simultaneously draw the graph of both graphs on one picture. So you have a you have a three-dimensional space. So suppose this is you have x, y, z coordinates, and then in x, y, z coordinates you have a uh, just graph of this function y is equal to derivative of the function and z is equal f of x. So then, of course, this uh, curve satisfies the differential equation dz minus y dx is equal to z. So this equation, this kind of fact wave equation defined in three space some plane field. So what does plane field look like? So then we have this is x, say this is y, 
and, and this is z. And uh, then this plane field is what is parallel, always parallel to y-axis. And the slope dz over dzx, dz over dx slope is equal to y. So therefore, it's a plane which is kind of tangent to y-axis. But as I go along y-plane, they rotate. So this is called convex structure. So this, this is a local model for non-integrable plane field in three-dimensional space. It's called contact structure. So we have this contact plane field, and our graph of our graph of our uh, this simultaneous graph of function and derivative is tangent to to this plane field, and such plane field tangent to this to this. Uh, uh, contact structure called Legendre. In this case, the Legendre curve, but I can, you can easily to generalize it to high dimension what it means. So Legendre, Legendre and submanifold in general, it's a, uh, so you have a two and plus one dimensional. Suppose this is n dimensional, this is y dimensional, this is one dimensional. You have a still two and plus one dimensional space with this plane field, and then submanifold of dimension n is called Legendre if it's tangent to this plane. And if, if you have a submanifold given by equation z equal function and y is equal just gradient of this function, then you always get this Legendre submanifold. So, now, let me kind of formulate the following theorem. Because as soon as they become tangent, 
then you, you get a, uh, so the derivatives are equal and you get self-intersection of this curve. And then the claim that this, this n is higher than this one. So if the thing would be, would be graphical, then this would be kind of version of roller theory. It would say that if you have a function with positive derivative, that the value of this n would be bigger than this value of this n. Now, if I drop this condition of Legendrian isotopy, then this claim would, of course, be non-true, because what I can do, I can do something like this, right? So I can always the time move in the this positive slope and then still come arbitrary down in the direction. But somehow, miraculously, this condition that you have a Legendrian isotopy force for this thing. So this is kind of another uh, instance of kind of relation of equation and syntactic geometry with more C. So now let me, uh, if I have time, I kind of come back to this and explain uh, meaning of the <coughs> statement. Is in fact, it's very deep statement and really foundation of the whole three-dimensional quantum geometry. But uh, uh, let me, I do because I, I afraid that I may be short of time, so I will start to kind of proving something and then if I have time I start the application. So as I said, kind of my tactics would be to, to trace complexity for dimensions. So how you do this? So let's consider the following, uh, the following uh, example. So this is the kind of elementary, what I'm explaining now is really elementary sets here. So you have a, so suppose you have a, the following picture. So you have a, say, space R2N. And in this space R2N, I have a some Lagrangian metric. Now, suppose I apply, so, so now I have a some map of R2N to R2N. Oh, let's call it F capital. Some map R2N to R2N, which uh, preserves the symplectic form. So you have some symplectic, uh, symplectic form in this space omega, and this map preserves the symplectic form. So you have a symplectic transformation. And then I take a uh, Lagrangian manifold F of F. So image of Lagrangian manifold under symplectic map is again another Lagrangian map. So now I, yeah, I, I do this construction as follows. So I take a R2N cross R2N cross R2N, take a product of three copies. Then I take here in this product, I consider graph of my map F. And then, uh, then let's, so this is kind of one thing. Let's take L, and then you have a graph of this thing. So notice, let's take here form omega, here form minus omega, and here again form omega. So this is a, again symplectic space of this dimension. So gamma f, as I explained, graph of symplectic map is a Lagrangian submanifold. So you have one Lagrangian submanifold here. Now I can take a L cross gamma f. This is the, this Lagrangian submanifold in this in this triple product. Now I can take another Lagrangian submanifold. I take these two. I take these two. And I take here a diagonal. And diagonal again Lagrange. And suppose here, let, let's take it in this, in this manifold, in this R2, take another Lagrangian submanifold L0. So L sitting here and L0 sitting, sitting there. But it's a, in fact all the same thing, so you can talk about this intersection of this. So now you can take a gamma F. So, so you have a manifold. L cross 
gamma f, and you have a manifold delta cross L0. And I, so this is a two Lagrangian subvariable in, in this product. And notice that intersection, if you take an intersection of these two, it's a kind of, it's the same as the intersection of f of L and L0. Right? Because what this, does it mean is that L times, you have a L times, so what is the point of L times gamma f? It's the point of the form x, y, f of y. Right? And the point of this one is the point of the form x, x, and then some, some z. Right? And so to say that this is equal to this would mean that y is equal to x, so therefore f of y is equal to f of x, and f of x is, uh, so and f of x has to be equal to z. So in the intersection of f of x with z, which it belongs to L0, is the same as the intersection of these two, two things. So anyway, now, what did we kind of gain by this thing? So notice, so suppose I started with my manifold L is, which is what, say, almost flat. What was some kind of graph? Almost, almost flat manifold. And then suppose that diffeomorphism F was a small. So then gamma F was also graphical with respect to this split which I explained. And then product of two almost flat things is again almost flat. And product uh, this is completely flat, and say, if this is almost flat, this again is your something almost flat. So, let's, but notice that if we iterate, the what is important, that you can kind of iterate this procedure, uh, procedure as many times as you wish, and you still get something almost flat. Namely, you see, you have a, suppose this, say, C1 norm of this diffeomorphism is less than epsilon. And then you have a kind of take a composition with another diffeomorphism. And suppose that C1 norm of this one less than epsilon. And then if you use as a norm kind of maximum norm, then the C1 norm of the kind of any length product, pro product is still be less than epsilon. So you can start with flat, with even flat L, and then apply something almost cross with something almost flat, epsilon flat, and another epsilon flat, and another epsilon flat, and by taking product of million of the thing, you get something completely non-flat. But still, in, the, in this big pro product, the thing will be almost flat in, this C, in the kind of C1, maximum C1 norm. And so, therefore, instead of intersecting by you can always unwind. You can you have a, you started with with, with Lagrangian manifold, and then you start to deform it with uh, some Lagrangian isotopy. And each step of this Lagrangian isotopy, you uh, you think small. You divide it by your isotopy, but a lot of small steps. And so and then you present it in the your original intersection problem of f of l, which is completely non-flat, can be terrible. But you present it as a product of many, many, many flat things. And so, so therefore, original intersection of very kind of complicated thinking, original space, is presented as an intersection problem of almost flat thing, but in very high dimensional space. That's what, that's what I call trading this dimension, the complexity for dimension. So, therefore, let me kind of say what do you get. So I, uh, this is a kind of really elementary kind of set theory of the thing, just understanding this intersection. But let me just, uh, uh, I don't have time to go through all this. Let me just formulate the results which you get by kind of applying precisely this argument, nothing more. So, so this is called 
you can, uh, given, suppose you have uh, the space, syntactic space with coordinates x and y, and then, as I said, if this Lagrangian manifold is graphical, then this Lagrangian manifold, y is a, in fact, can be written in the form y is equal to graph of this gradient of the function, function f. Okay? So any graphical Lagrangian manifold is this gradient of graph of gradient of the function. So, so therefore, in this case, this is just generating function for this Lagrangian manifold. I would like to be able to define this function something more kind of complicated object, not really graph. So for this, I will allow to introduce extra parameters. Suppose you have a function which is dependent on some extra parameter c. And now I can see this equation y is equal to this plus, let me just write df over dx, meaning this just gradient. Of, of this one, but then I have to do something with respect to parameters. And then I say this is equal, I will require df of dx is equal to zero. So you un understand by this, it's kind of, you, you have the system of two equations and you exclude this c out from this equation and plug zero and you get it some sum. And so if you can present your Lagrangian manifold in this form, then you say that f of x c is a generating function for Lagrangian. So what does this really mean in kind of symplectic term? You see, suppose I have a, uh, you, you get my symplectic space R to F with coordinate x, y. And now suppose I multiply it by symplectic space R to N capital and this kind of symplectic coordinate c and eta. And now, suppose I have some function. Suppose I have some function on this space. No, oh, sorry. So suppose I have a graphical Lagrangian manifold in this space. So this space is a, you can present it in the form like Rn cross Rn. This is a xc space cross Rn cross are uh, n capital, and this is a y eta space. So you have this polarization, xc and y eta. So function of, if you have a function of x theta, this function defined in Lagrangian submanifold in this space, just given, given by equation uh, y is equal to f over dx, and eta is equal to f of over uh, dx. And now what I do, I intersect with the space eta equals zero and project the intersection to, to, to the space x1 along c chord. So this is called in symplectic geometry symplectic reduction. So this always construction generate from symplectic manifold, from Lagrangian manifold in big space, Lagrangian manifold in small space. So anyway, so this is what this means. And this, if you just analyze what it was going on in, in, this, in this construction, I was precisely proving existence of generating function. Now, so you get the following theory. So suppose, suppose you have, uh, suppose you have this Lagrangian, Lagrangian manifold, and inside, inside R to F. And suppose this Lagrangian manifold was uh, given by generating function, was, was given, say, y is equal to gradient F of X. Then, there exists, now, suppose, let, uh, and let say Lt be any Lagrangian isotopy. So Lagrangian isotopy. So the formation of this Lagrangian manifold, we are Lagrangian family of Lagrangian manifold, such, such that L0 is equal to L. Then there exists some big N depending on the, on this isotopy such that and the function and the function and the function uh, say of 
the form uh, f of f of x c to this function f given on the space r n cross r n capital r n capital and the function f of f c we generate we generate uh, we generate this manifold L1. So, moreover, this function f of xc can be chosen in the following form. It can be chosen as a, some quadratic function of c. Non -de non -de this is a non-degenerate quadratic form. Non-degenerate quadratic form of c. And last function, I will write epsilon of xc. So let's assume, for instance, that my isotopy was this complex support. And then you have a function f of x, xc with compact support. So you have a really quadratic, essentially quadratic function of this extra variable, non degenerate. And plus, <coughs> plus some function with compact support. So this is a really kind of a proof of this, uh, just an, uh, analysis of this argument, just nothing more. Just you, you, you kind of keep, keep, you split our manifold to, so why quadratic function come from? Quadratic function come from the diagonal. So we have to deal with the diagonal. Diagonal not is exactly in a zero section. Diagonal is a Lagrangian manifold linear Lagrangian manifold. And every linear Lagrangian manifold is a differential of quadratic function. And so this, the, out of this diagonal, you get this quadratic function. But otherwise, this is just a, an analysis of this, to this thing. So now, so this is immediately already sufficient for proving all results, well, almost sufficient for proving all results which I mentioned. First of all, you can immediately substitute Rn to any manifold. Because by a simple trick, you take an arbitrary manifold and embed it in Rn. And then you can kind of extend this Lagrangian manifold there and extend the formation there. Then you, you first construct this function on this bigger space and then restrict to our manifold. So just via the simple trick, you, you, you will get it for arbitrary manifold. Then, second, you can generalize it substituting the word Lagrangian isotopy by this Legendrian isotopy, which I mentioned. And let me just kind of uh, uh, explain you why this is sufficient. For instance, what would we get in the case of the Poincaré theorem? In the case of Poincaré theorem, you have this function. First, suppose we started with function f of x, which was generating this, uh, which, as I was describing, was generating the small, small area preserving diffusion. And then, after, uh, after this, all this kind of, uh, now you apply apply our our area preserving transformation. <coughs> so now, okay, you take the area preserving transformation and split it to this composition composition of of, of many many small. And then, or you, then you just kind of apply this this procedure. So you you start you start with uh, some small one, and then you deform it to kind of to the one which is very far from identity. But generating function persists after adding some quadratic form. So I can add some quadratic form of some extra variable, and after this. This function, of course, will be already some different function and depending on C, but this function still will exist for, for, for this one. It's the same kind of boundary condition as here. And so now look. And I have to write this condition that you have a uh, so get out of this function how to get kind of what, what I want here. Get this function which, which I'm interested in here. You do it with a kind of mini max trick. 
So let's take, a, you see, Q of C, it's a some quadratic form, non-degenerate quadratic form. So you have a function which is at infinity look like, for each fixed x, you have a function which is at infinity looks like uh, non-degenerate quadratic form. And for this type of function, you always want, can find uh, some kind of minimax width. So you just consider all possible uh, submanifold, which is uh, kind of asymptotically look like uh, stable manifold of our quadratic form, and take, a, uh, take minimum and take a kind of maximum through all of them. And you get uh, some minimax value. And Minimax value has this property that it continuously depends on parameters. And so therefore, you get a, choosing this minimax value, you get a, you get a kind of piecewise smooth function, which is already its normal function, just taking this minimax value. And then take, taking, and, and then now you kind of argue in terms of the critical point of the function. Maybe this uh, case of one dimensional, uh, a little bit more transparent. So let's uh, remember my statement. That I said you have this kind of front. And then we want to prove that the value of here bigger than the value of here. But now instead of this function of one variable, we get function of x c, where c is some kind of belongs to high dimensional space. And it will it's a uh, depends on this C variable as a kind of quadratic function at infinity. Now you take for each x, take this minimax value of this, of this function. And you get minimax value automatically critical value of this function as well. Because it's a critical point. So it belongs to this front. So what I get by changing minimax value, I will find in this front some kind of piecewise smooth curve inside the front. And the slope of this curve is still df over dx, and this is a precise our y, and it has to be positive. And so we have a piecewise smooth, piecewise smooth curve with positive derivative, and this is still enough to conclude the value on this n is bigger than the, the value of this one. Well, my time actually expired, but let me let me say a few more things. So this is a kind of really elementary, elementary more theory and its relation with uh, relation with symplectic topology. But this is not really sufficient for not really sufficient for kind of high power applications. You get quite a lot, but uh, turns out that if you want to, to, to have more, you have to generalize this more theory in the following way. Well, what is it? Let, let's, let's kind of consider this problem again about Lejean Benke. So I will take uh, about three more minutes. So let's consider this problem of this, of this Lejean Benke and, and the Lejean Benke is a topic. So, in fact, you can consider nice problem about Legendrian knots. So here I was considering just non-closed Legendrian curve, but let's suppose, let's consider the case of Legendrian, closed Legendrian knot in R3. So you have an embedding of S1 to, to R3, which is tangent to context structure. So you call Legendrian curve, and we want to classify them, say, up to Legendrian as a and again, I would like to try to, to kind of to, to define some invariant looking on some kind of more C on this thing. Well, so you can go somewhere with this uh, kind of generating function business, but it doesn't really give you all the story. So what you would like to kind of to, to do is the following. So let's take a, instead of this one, take a projection to this uh, xy plane. So this is an xz projection, and we have this kind of projection to xy plane. So you know this, when you, how do you, how do you get 
usually uh, uh, estimate for, uh, from function on the number of critical points. To get estimate of the number of critical points in Morse theory, you have to uh, define some kind of homology out of it. So you, you say, you take a Morse complex, you take a complex generated by Morse function, and define boundary operator generated by gradient trajectory for this one, and what you get is in, turned out to be, say, isomorphic to homology of the manifold, and the number of critical points is bounded below by the rank of homology. This is kind of standard principle. So here, on this picture, this uh, critical point is intersection point, and gradient trajectory looks like kind of this immersed, immersed disk. So what you need to, to, to do in, kind of in, in general case, to consider some kind of more advanced combinatorics. Maybe it's not if 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 all kind of this disk in intersection look so simple like this, these two ends and then it's fine. But but in general, of course, you have a kind of much more much worse picture. So you would like to out of this kind of all this disk with many ends, you also want to do some kind of more seed combinatorics of this more seed. And then it turns out that you also can do this. And for instance, you can define the following thing. So let me let me define the, the following invariant. So let's take a let's take this front of region, <coughs> and then associated with this front, you can define the following complex. So you do the following thing: you take this front, then you smooth all right cusp and keep left cusp this cusp uh, as there. And then for each left, now, now let's consider, let's mark, enumerate all, uh, all intersection point and all remaining cusp. And now let's consider the following algebra. You can, I will define the Z2 coefficient, but you can define the Z coefficient. So this is the kind of analog of this Morse complex here. So you can just define the following. For any, so if you have a, uh, well, let's, let's do something more complicated. So for any uh, intersection point, for instance, A2, you define DA2, you just consider all disk would kind of look like this. And say this one more. So all these kind of polygonal disk, which you see here, and you just go around this boundary and write the product. For instance, DA2 is equal A3, A, say, A3, A4, A3, A4, A5, and then, for instance, you have also this disk, you say, you say this is equal plus A2. So for any such disk, you can write this product of this end. And for any left cast, you do exactly the same thing, but add one, one plus the same thing. And then, miraculously, you get that d squared is equal to z. And if you take a homology, so you get some differential algebra, and if you take a homology of the differential algebra, then you get, a, in fact, invariant of the Lejeunean isotope. So this is a kind of version, what I'm explaining is a version of some construction of kind of Lejeunean contour homology, which was done independently by Chikanov and uh, Koffer and me. And, um, this version belongs to uh, young postdoc Lenny Ng. So uh, this, in fact, this is a kind of look like one-dimensional thing, but you can have an absolutely equivalent combinatorial description of, of this invariant in any dimension. And what I suggest, I, let me finish with the following kind of intriguing question. You can take a Three dimension, you can take, say, not, usual not in three dimensional space. And then, given not in three dimensional space, you can associate with this not, Legendrian not in five dimensions. Namely, you have a, uh, this, uh, in, well, I, I need to, to say a little bit more about quantum geometry, I don't have time, so let me just say it. So you have a node, and then space of R3, and take a, what is called space of contact element to R3, space of all ten plane, tangent plane to R3. So this is, a, this is just R3 cross R S2, manifold topologically. So this manifold is a, has a standard contact structure, again, like I, I described before. And any curve and any surface, well, any submanifold in three-dimensional space 
Legendrian curve, I, I get a two-dimensional Legendrian torus in this case. And in there, oh, so, topologically, this torus is already unknown. There's kind of topology to the field. But kind of my claim is, or it's not claim, it's a hope, it's not a theory, that the Legendrian topology of this node remember topology of our origin. So there is a, some kind of recent physical kind of speculation which, which uh, kind of saying that this is probably true. But, and then, what, what in fact, there is a, some kind of activity which, which I don't know, maybe they already produced some theorem, but when, when I left, they didn't yet, but so they were computing some example, for some particular example, this type of algebra for, for the node. And to see, I, I, I think that indeed this, this algebra computed Legendrian kind of homology algebra kind of, uh, uh, based on this more theory computed for the torus, in fact, produced you some information about our uh, node. Of course, one can say, one, one can ask uh, why we want to do that. You start with one dimensional node and then suddenly you went to this five dimensional space and then consider two dimensional surface. But still, when you have a kind of uh, relation between completely different subjects, that usually something could come on. Okay, thank you. Just study, just contact invariance of this. 
And again, I think that this kind of contact invariant of this manifold may kind of know almost everything, or at least quite a lot about the topology of origin. And so you, you so again, for this thing, there is a something like this, something like chromophyton invariant for this one. And uh, I think also should be true that this uh, kind of quantum invariant of three manifold can be reconstructed. More questions? Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. The next time. Thank you. 
this doesn't matter. This, you can, uh, by change of coordinates, you can kind of make them standard. But in dimension four, this is not true. And if you have an arbitrary form, if you have a, say, arbitrary form, which is a non degenerate and Q symmetric, the arbitrary differential to form, then the condition that it is locally standard is the equivalent to the condition that it's closed by dark by well by dark material. And so you can define symplectic structure on four dimensional space as a closed non degenerate to form or equivalently a form which is equivalent to, to this particular form. So symplectic form manifold is you can define again either a manifold with this non degenerate to form or we can say it's just glued out of the Euclidean chart with this form using the map which preserves the form using symplectic map. So already this definition I have somehow mixed in this complex structure and the definition of symplectic form and this is a, it's very useful to kind of to pertain this namely <coughs> turns out to the following always true. So suppose you have a, some symplectic well again I'm only talking about four manifold but it's in fact general fact. Suppose you have a, any symplectic four manifold and then you can always find what is called almost complex structure. That means that on you can find on, you can make tangent bundle to be complex complex line bundle, complex vector bundle. So introduce complex structure on each tangent space such that on each tangent space this linear symplectic form omega n and uh, this complex structure J will be related precisely by, by this condition. So that means that you have a you can uh, uh, say choose Hermitian metric on our manifold in such a way that uh, this uh, this Hermi that our omega will be imaginary part of this Hermitian. So if J is integrable, it's a normal, normal complex structure, then this is a precise definition of Keller manifold. The existence of such uh, emission forms, such as imagined in part, is this closed and automatically excluded non degenerate Q symmetric form. But then uh, it's always it's always the case. So it's, uh, uh, you can always find that J, but not necessarily integral. You understand? Symplectic manifold is the same as a kind of almost scalar manifold. So, moreover, choice of such J, of course, not unique, but it's uh, kind of contractible choice. The space of this J, which for which this you can uh, this condition is satisfied, is in fact contractible space. So, in kind of up to homotopy, you can canonically choose, choose some such. So, I will be kind of always using some j with, with this omega and in a sense my uh, geometry will be very much related to the j but omega will be like this guard in background so like maybe even in, in definition this omega would not appear but this fact that you have this the omega and essentially the main condition that omega of uh, that omega on any complex direction is positive, which is a kind of correlate to the fact that this metric uh, is positive definite, is uh, uh, just would be really the major fact which, uh, as Rome would say, tame this J. You see, if you have a, you, I will be considering some kind of analysis in, inside almost complex manifold, and then in if J is there is not this background symplectic form, then this J somehow misbehaves. And so really you cannot prove anything good. But if you have this uh, omega which guards this J, then, then somehow everything fine. And as a result, it turns out that in fact the result will be independent on, on J, but only independent on omega. That's kind of what it's called. Okay, so this was about symplectic manifold. I, I come and tell you more later. But then let me kind of go down to, to dimension three. So in dimension four, I will be considering considering symplectic manifold and symplectic structure, kind of to help me with topology. And in dimension three, I will be 
considering uh, context structure. The context structure is kind of at first glance is something which looks completely different than subjective structure. So this is a because you have a in our three manifold, you have a two-dimensional subbundle of the tangent bundle. So at each point of our three manifold, we have a tangent tangent plane. So a tangent plane field. So we have a tangent plane field, and this tangent plane field required to be completely non-integrable. So like uh, if I well let's assume that this is a orientable C, then it can be defined by, by some one form, uh, this is fast in equation, and then uh, by Frobenius theorem, non-integrability can be just, well, what is the integrability? Integrability by Frobenius theorem means that the form D alpha restricted to C has, should vanish. But non-integrability means that this is never vanish. So uh, that means that you, on, on each C you have a the alpha is area form or syntactic form. So what is the advantage of, of this kind of, you know, in, in three-dimensional topology really people looked at a lot of extra structure to, to study string names. For instance, one of, one of the extra structure people considered but is, um, which is very useful are creation. So you can say that three manifold foliated by two dimensional leads. And foliation is precisely object that you get that this you have a the tangent plane distribution for foliation is integrable. So it has a condition that the alpha is equal to zero. And then you get this kind of structure. But then global topology of foliation is extremely complicated. Because well, you have this leaves and you have this dynamics of this leaves and Really, it's extremely sensitive to perturbation, so if you change a little bit, you get a, uh, well, usually, sometimes not, but usually you get completely different topology of, of this of this foliation. And so it's very kind of much more uh, uh, object, much more difficult, I would say, object to handle. The context structure, like synthetic structure, has no local invariance. So that locally, even just contact form, not even contact structure, but even contact form in, in some local coordinate system can be, can be, for instance, always written in this form. You can always choose it for the Darwin normal form, or you can choose many other normal form, but this is one of the possibilities. And so, locally, there is no, 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 no invariance. So this is not maybe so kind of, uh, so you say, so what? Because foliation also locally has no, no invariance. But most importantly, this there is no global invariance as in some sense. Is a, is low, there are no continuous global invariance as well. Namely, if you have a family of context structure, so you have a just you, you deform your plane field, but in such a way that it keeps to be always non-integrable, always context structure, that all this family in a sense trivial. That means that that there exists uh, some isotopy of the manifold such that <coughs> if you kind of push forward uh, say C0 and this is isotopy, you get CT. So uh, this is a stereo of gray and it just says that there is no deformation of contact structure. Contact structure is discrete object. You can kind of classify contact structure discrete. And so therefore it, uh, in a sense uh, this, 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 for instance, particular property make it, kind of, I, I would say, in some sense more useful in topology than foliation. So, now, let me explain what is the relation of, say, context structure and synthetic structure. The relation of context, on, on the first glance, it looks like different notion, but in fact, it's very close notion. So, like, if you take a, take a contact manifold, then, well, I can, I will define it something non-invariant way, but you can, uh, you can, could do it also invariantly. Let's, let's take a, a, this, um, uh, our three-dimensional manifold multiplied by R. So you get a formula. <coughs> and here we have to say contact form. And then you can, on this manifold, say T is the coordinates along this factor, and let's, uh, let's consider differential form T to the equal to T R. So this is a kind of, easy to check that this is a synthetic form on this manifold. So you have the cylindrical manifold. On this cylindrical 
your manifold you have this intake form and this form if you take a vector field d or dt then this vector field is dilating vector field for this form so namely namely if you take a lead derivative of omega <coughs> along d or dt then of course you get just e to the t uh, well actually you get just omega and so so therefore just flow along this vector field of course just multiply omega by e to the t so uh, and conversely if you have a four manifold and on this four manifold you have a, this syntactic dilating flow then the space of trajectories of this flow is automatically contact mass and so there is a kind of the, in, in a sense in a sense, you can formulate contact geometry as a projective syntactic geometry. So you have this kind of dilating action, and then kind of all notion of, com of syntactic geometry, of contact geometry, can be formulated as a notion of, of this uh, four dimensional syntactic geometry, invariant or equivariant with respect to this action. So, so this is really the relation between these two is very good. So finally, I will need one more kind of general notion which we will be dealing with. This is a syntactic manifold with contact bound. Syntactic manifold with contact boundary. So what you will have, you will have say, say four-dimensional syntactic manifold. And then you have a boundary which is a three-dimensional three contact manifold. And then what does it mean? I, of course, Synthetic structure does not define any uh, contact structure of the boundary, and we need some kind of uh, condition in which sense they agree on the boundary. And the condition is a, is a two conditions. So first, well, you see, this C you can define by uh, by some let's suppose it's defined by someone or alpha. And so one condition is the following: that uh, omega restricted to C is proportional. To, to this d alpha restricted to c. So you see, this when I change form alpha, then the form d alpha will, on each c will be just conformally changed. So it's conformal plus of form d alpha depends only on c, not of alpha. And so I want my synthetic form to be to coincide with this synthetic form d alpha on c up to this of some not say positive factor. So this is one condition, and then the second condition is some kind of uh, orientation condition. It says the following thing: that if you have a if you have a uh, symplectic manifold, then that of course omega square is a volume form. So so therefore this manifold automatically oriented, and hence it defines some orientation on the boundary. But also contact structure knows its own orientation. It's also oriented. Because if I take an alpha versus the alpha, alpha versus the alpha is, is, a, is a volume form. And notice that sign of alpha the alpha is dependent on sign of alpha. I can even change alpha by minus alpha, but still will be the same alpha versus the alpha. So therefore, contact manifold knows that its orientation. And so I require that this contact orientation with the boundary and symplectic should concern. So it's a uh, two orientation concern. Okay, so let me explain you what this notion means in terms of uh, like contact geometry. I already told you for any for any symplectic form you can uh, introduce this compatible J. So this omega will look like imaginary part of the corresponding kind of quasi period image. Now you can choose this J in such a way that each C so you can choose J in such a way that each C will be complex subspace. You can, this is also, can be always done, that we have this manifold with contact boundary, we have this G C is, have this, uh, C is a complex tangent line to boundary. And then, uh, this condition, in fact, transformed to the following condition. So remember that omega of, say, of some V, J, V, was 
have no little bit complex analysis, you know that there is a notion of pseudo complexity. So in, in complex analysis, I will be talking certainly in more about this, but about this pseudo complexity, but let me kind of do what you mean today. So in a, okay, so in geometry there is notion of convexity. And a complex analysis, there is notion of pseudo convexity, which is, from my point of view, much more fundamental than the notion of convexity. And this is a, uh, this extremely bad thing that it was called this pseudo convexity, and so it creates this kind of feeling that there is something really not so kind of true. So, but in fact, this pseudo convexity is a really major, kind of more fundamental notion of convexity. So, what?
So let me just start to prove to, to something. So my kind of priority is mentioned to more the curve, and I will be, uh, this will be the main object which I will be doing this for, for all this my application. So you see, if you take a uh, <coughs> integral, well, if you have a complex manifold, then locally you have plenty, plenty of holomorphic curves. In fact, locally you have plenty of holomorphic submanifold of even high dimension. But if you take a non-integrable complex structure. Then, if you, you try to find kind of complex sub-manifold of non-integrable manifold, you immediately found that as soon as the dimension, complex dimension of the sub-manifold is bigger than one, then the kind of D-bar equation is extremely overdetermined. The integrability condition can re really uh, miraculously cut down this overdeterminacy and you get determined equation for any dimension. But if you go to kind of to gen generic uh, non-integrable almost complex structure, then as well, we say it's in fact obvious. So we have a, so so if you want to map uh, k-dimensional real almost complex manifold, you say complex structure J1, say JB, into another two-n-dimensional manifold with complex structure J double. And what does it mean that this is a uh, holomorphic map. That means that the differential of this map should be a uh, uh, complex linear map between these two complex spaces. So what is the dimension of the space of this complex map? So, you have a, so this is a k dimension, this is a uh, n dimension. So dimension, real dimensions is complex dimension kn and real dimension 2kn. Right? And the dimension of all maps is, of course, is defined by 2k by 2 n metric, is 4k n. Uh, dimension, no, what is it? Yeah, dimension is 4k n. So, so therefore, co-dimension kind of, uh, uh, is, is precisely, so, so therefore, to define complex, to, to, uh, to, the, to cut complex, uh, homomorphic map out of all maps, you have to write 2kn equation. But you only have uh, 2n unknown function. So therefore, it's only determined that k is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's over. So, so therefore, uh, you don't have a homomorphic submanifold of high dimension, but homomorphic curve exists then in as many in almost complex cases and as in complex case. You can talk. So this was known to classics, but, uh, but they were existed in analysis by the name of uh, uh, quasi-analytic functions. So this was studied by Gecko and many people. But I think before Gromov, nobody really kind of realized that this kind of quasi-analytic function is the same as a homomorphic curve in non-integrable complex structure. OK, so anyway, so you have, a, uh, you have this thing, and now, you know that in complex manifold, locally, of course, you have a theory of homomorphic curve, but globally, you don't, go, don't have this theory unless this manifold is kept. So there's no kind of meaningful theory of kind of global homomorphic curve, you say, if it's in non kerner manifold. And the same true in, in this case. If you take an arbitrary almost complex manifold, then, as I say, this homomorphic curve would be kind of, would not satisfy some compactness condition, so you really cannot define any good theory of that. But as soon as you have a symplectic structure, taming them, then you have a kind of the same freedom of working with a homomorphic curve in almost complex manifold, and, and even, I would say, more than in integral case. And this was the kind of first discovered and introduced by Gromov, and, well, independently in some different way by some other people, but this is the kind of <coughs> contribution was made by Gromov. OK, so let's return now to, to, to my situation.
where this uh, tangent line is convex, and such points are called complex points. And complex point again generically divided in two types. So one called elliptic hyperbolic point, another uh, <laughs> elliptic complex point, another hyperbolic point. So let me just not to give you now definition, but let me just kind of say that, for instance, if you take a, if you take a, and this is a true up to some jet, my definition. So suppose you have some R3 sitting inside, inside my tangent, well, for instance, simple locus. And then this R3 is collated by complex lines. So now, if you have a surface, our surface sitting inside this R3, then this you get some kind of height function defined by this line, and I can talk about maximum and settle points of, of, of this, this function, then this uh, as a maximum minimum correspond to elliptic point and settle correspond to hyperbolic point. And up to some uh, uh, kind of higher order, third order, you can always find kind of escalating R3 to any to any surface and define this as the same. Okay. So, it was known in complex analysis and it was explored by, by Bishop and by many others the following thing. So, if you take an elliptic point, and then near this elliptic point, you always have a family of circles kind of converging to this point, such that each of the circles span holomorphic disk. Like, in, in this picture, you have a family of this, you can cut by, 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 by plants and get this homomorphic disk. Exactly the same thing locally to all. And now you will want to ask, what happened globally? Suppose, say, you have only two elliptic points. And then you, you can, you can uh, uh, have this local family emanating from this point, local family emanating from this point. Do they kind of meet and do how far do they can be continued. And it turns out that in this situation, when you have a like, synthetic manifold, or almost complex manifold, with pseudo complex boundary, or synthetic manifold with complex boundary, and so, so let me just. Three 
three-dimensional ball collated by this homomorphic disk and bounded, bounded by this sphere mass. OK, so let me kind of tell you this is already a pretty strong state. Yeah, I'll show you kind of how this explore to get some kind of interesting topological concepts. <coughs>
these two things has to be always transversal. And because it has to be always transversal, this characteristic relation cannot have basic and should be always transversal. Because uh, if you have, a, if they are not transversal, then you have a, if two complex lines have a common real line, then they have to concept. That would mean that this disk is tangent to the boundary from inside. And this contradicts the student context. And so they always transversal. And but if you have a uh, so if you have a correlation transversal to this kind of simple fibration by, by this circle, it cannot have a uh, closed leaf because this leaf would have to have a tangency for maximum minimum. So in particular, it says the context structure like this never can appear in the boundary of of this of a synthetic matrix. So there is this kind of dichotomy of, of context structure. Context structure could be tight and over twisted. So this is an example of, of, of over twisted complex context structure. It's a context structure for which you can find such disk with, with, with this type of with limit set. And uh, so the kind of what I proved you, well, quote unquote, proved that I have to check, but essentially what I proved you is that if you have a context structure which is a kind of symplectically fillable, then it always stuck, it cannot be over twisted. So the standard, for instance, context structure on the sphere with which bounds the standard round ball, it's always, always tight because it's, it's, it's filled by ball. Okay. So this is just maybe not so kind of exciting for you, but let me let me kind of give you give you now kind of more topological application. So, so just to which one is the which one is the field, the standard one? Or yeah, the sta standard one is still. And, and this one is example of not. Because standard one is in fact can be if you take a round ball and the standard synthetic structure around ball, then the standard context structure is three, with, which defined by really Playing perpendicular to cold vibration is uh, compatible with, with the exact and, and this is really, we have to think about it as the cold. cold yeah, this is the cold. Half, this is half of them are like this. Half of them tight, half of them are twisted. And there is a, I can tell you kind of a lot about this kind of dichotomy, a lot of things known about this now, but this would be really moving to completely different elements. Okay, so, well, I think. Well, our time goes very fast, so let, let me just ask if I want to uh, play a bit more with this, but let me kind of give you, uh, move to settle uh, kind of some other application of the same thing. So let me prove you the following statement as application of the same circle of ideas. So take four-dimensional ball. Just round four-dimensional ball. In, in, in situ, which is standard synthetic round ball. Now, suppose inside this two-dimensional ball, you have a, some uh, two-dimensional disk, topological two-dimensional disk, embedded, embedded in this before with a boundary on the, on the sphere. And we have the following property that this delta is symplectic disk, that the symplectic form on this delta is positive. And also that d delta is an unknown, for instance, is just a class. Let's assume that it is a class. So we have the standard circle on the boundary, and it's bound kind of something inside. And this something inside is a pathological disk. So question, can this thing be not or not? Is it, is it kind of possible to, that this thing is not? Well, for, for those of you who are not topologists, let me tell you that there are plenty of two-dimensional nodes in R4. There are as many two-dimensional nodes in R4, at least as many as one-dimensional nodes in, in R3. And so, so there are a lot of knotted disks. But now, question. Can it be noted with this condition that, form, that it's symplectic? And the theorem that it's not, so the theorem that it's unknown. And let me prove it using the same type of idea. So you see, this disk on the boundary, so this boundary, this boundary is a, in fact, so this, 
circle S1 inside this bar. And this is just very round standards. And it's, it's, it has precisely one elliptic complex point here. <coughs> so now I can always find almost complex structure kind of compatible with omega, which is standard near the boundary and for which this disk is a holomorphic disk. Because I just declare, you see, it's very easy to construct almost complex structure. I just declare each tangent line to this disk to be complex line. And because it's already symplectic, it does not contradict this compatibility. And so I, I make almost complex structure for which this disk is holomorphic disk. And then I extend it somehow inside. And then I start to feel it from, from my homomorphic disk from this point. So I feel, feel. Then at, at first, complex structure standard, this is just a flat disk. But then they kind of become deviate, deviate, deviate. And what I claim, there's a kind of no choice for them as just to connect me the standard disk here with this, my original disk there. But because, as I said, two homomorphic disks never can touch each other. So linking number of, or intersection number of any of these two disks is, is, uh, is always zero. And eventually, this disk has to reach this one, because they're developing, developing, that they don't have any choice as a kind of to reach this one. But as soon as it touches this disk, it has to consent. And so you have a kind of the whole family of this disk, and this is a, a kind of isotope. So this is a precisely, you see, what happens, this is a kind of indication of what happens. The symplectic topology is precisely kind of topology for like lazy topologies. Because uh, in topology, people are kind of, well, develop extremely kind of uh, inventive constructions. So you, if, you, if you listen to real topologists, he would do some kind of miracles for you on blackboard, just converting one thing into another. And so, like, for, uh, for uh, uh, mostly, topology developed two, how to prove that two things are different. But to prove that two things are different, you need some invariance, you need some kind of complicated machine. But usually there is no machinery to prove that two things are the same, except just, like, uh, by hand, just glue, and you, you have to really, it's, it's really art, not science. But this thing transforms into some kind of science because what you, 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 you really don't know how to, how to make this isotope. Mm -hmm. by, by then, by solving this Debar equation, by fun, finding family of the disk, somehow you, you will produce this isotope by, by itself. Can you just point out where exactly you've been using the effect of omega on the delta isotope? Because I used, I, I, I picked complex structure for this, this delta is homomorphic disk. And then this, this, on, this uh, uh, my complex structure should be compatible. And main thing of compatibility is that omega should be positive on all complex directions. And so if from the very beginning omega was not po com positive on at somewhere, I, I, I could not do this. <coughs> okay. So just another example of this type, I, I don't have time for it, would be the following. You can prove there is this uh, set theorem which tell, tell you that if you have any diffeomorphism at S3, then it always extends to the ball. And just there's an argument precisely like this which, which, which shows this. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, so the original kind of this existing proof is it again extremely kind of complicated and elaborate. And, and this one, of course, it's used some analysis, but it's just proved in, in few lines. So 
filmul. Tu când mergi, îți prezioarele îi contestă. În zi, eu slice-it, slice-it by remote, by sphere, fill each sphere by remote and tips. And then, take an image. This sphere become very complicated, but still, they can be, on the boundary, they have still the same two elliptic points, because the context right is the boundary is in check. And then you fill them by homomorphic disk, and then by building them, you can interest them. Okay. So, one more kind of example of the, the same type, and uh, then I spend uh, minus five last minutes to something else. So, this kind of example can be generalized and pretty amazing from my point of view later. So, so let me define some an invariant. I, I was a kind of 